Now, in 1964, Lily Kalisko gave a paper to a group of anthroposophical physicians, Gold in the Signs of the Times, because she started her first solar eclipse experiments were in 27, then she did some in 36, I think, and then 47. Fantastic experiments. But she found in 1964, she was saying, you know, something happened. She says, it's starting in the 1950s, the gold wasn't crystallizing properly at all, these dark streaks that would happen when the moon was in front of the sun. She was getting them all the time, and she was wondering what it was and whether or not they could still use gold as a homeopathic medicine for the heart. Considering this, but what happened in the 1950s was the advent, great electrification of the planet, radar, all that yes. stuff, right, with light, with electricity as the fallen light ether, we've basically cutting ourselves off from the cosmos with this horrible electromagnetic environment that we've created, which is the exact opposite of what Tesla's technology, we would have had a, what wasn't electromagnetic his stuff, it was magnetodielectric, faster than light. So yeah, how do we turn it around? I don't know the answer, but I know what's wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hi, this is Bruce Lipton, and you're listening to Green Planet FM. Kia ora, greetings, and welcome to Green Planet FM 104.6. I'm Tim Lynch, and I trust that you are doing well. I invite you to stay with me over the next hour as we discuss and find ways to take care of our unique and magnificent green planet Earth. As we get closer to 15 years of broadcasting here on GreenPlanetFM.com, I am very keen to push the barriers a little more than the usual premise of environment, health and consciousness. And in today's interview, ask some broader questions as to the influences and forces that affect all biota on our planet, especially the forces that are an extension of our solar system and beyond. Today, with the media, be it local or global, having major difficulty at being trusted and believed, we have been impelled to source our information by other means, which includes wisdom that will embellish life, and in particular, assist us in becoming more knowledgeable and in a resource so as to strengthen the pillars of society, so that our children and youth of today can still realize and depend on an older generation remaining both positive and steadfast and that we will find the much-needed solutions to what is happening on Earth. That, on another level, certain crew of Spaceship Earth have not left their posts, that to the contrary... They are returning to their posts and calling for peace at all levels and to resolve all conflict and house and feed all suffering crew. These awakening crew are aware that we have to find innovative solutions to our present dilemma facing the 7.5 billion inhabitants of this profound and until now resilient yet fragile ship. Therefore, I'm asking all crew who are listening to answer this call, to remember why you have been born aboard ship and to recognize that you have major destiny waiting for you. As we tap into the deepest levels of self, to realize that there is a love component that is embedded in our being and all it may require to awaken it is a change of heart. Yes, that is correct, a change of heart. So, are you willing to take this journey I trust that you will, for let me assure you, the rewards are beyond your imagination and out of this world. With me today, I have Tom Brown. He is originally from the USA. He has been in New Zealand for many years now. And Tom has a deep understanding of many of the connections to how we as a human live on a planet, but more so that we are energy fields within a greater universal or divine energy field. And it's a very extensive way of looking as to how we are within the universe. So, kia ora, Tom, thank you for wanting to come in and share with all listeners. Kia ora, Tim, thank you. I appreciate having a nice chat with you. And uh, yes, yeah, certainly we live on a super organism and we are energy nodes, or as I say, anthropic 
consciousness nodes of the universe. And, you know, if we look at that from sort of standard science, none of that's true because we can't weigh or measure it. But yet our direct experience tells us something much more profound if we get beyond what's known as the discursive consciousness. Okay, you've used a few words in there that I'm not... Could you explain anthropic, please? Anthropic just means life-centered, or life as humans, anthros, like from Steiner, anthroposophy. Yes. But I call it anthropocentric, which is that the universe is created to sustain life, that that's the purpose of it, not that we're just some sort of random sort of meat puppets that just because stuff fell together from gravity from some miracle that the scientists... They don't like miracles except no. one, the Big Bang. Yes. They got to have that one. And everything else is their uh, dogma after from the mathematical. But yet here we are alive and the universe sustains us. And there's so many little pieces. You know, science has gone into all these little tiny areas and cut themselves off from the greater picture. But when you put the greater picture together, you realize we're living on a magical plane of existence. Well, this is true, and, and I think what you're saying is that from a holistic perspective that we need to see everything as an extension of everything else. We're all part of some greater whole. Absolutely, and this even goes to the microbial level. Well, of course, we know we need to breathe air. We're connected to the Earth's magnetic fields. But then we have the microbiome in our system. A lot of research coming out on that now. You know, People think, well, you need like probiotics to help your stuff go in the, in the system. But the whole microbiome, which is a collection of not only bacteria, but also archaea, which is a similar type of life form, that's actually an organ in the body, which is about four pounds or so, probably slightly larger than the liver, but it constitutes probably 80 to 90 percent of our DNA. It's only about 10 percent, or some say even less, of our DNA is actually human. So, and this is sort of the gut gastrointestinal tract. So we say, well, the mind, right, that's the intellect. You know, we have the heart. That's the intuition. And the gut with the microbiome is our instinct. And that's what connects us to everything. The plants actually have the same microbiome in them. We have this whole cycle going through. And a lot of people don't know, but the plants, they require the microbiome both for photosynthesis and to interlink with the mycelium networks, which are like the nerve system of the planet. So this microbiome brain we can call it the third brain as marco ruggiero brilliant researcher in this field has called it and now even the fourth brain because they're actually operating the microbiomes operating within our brain as well so yes so we look at it from that point of view we're absolutely interconnected you're throwing a lot at me just <laughs> like this because there's a thing called embraining that's just come out recently where they realize a mind in our brain and intelligence there we've got also brain in our heart and as you say we've also got this gut intelligence and that they're able to find a way in which to bring all three into coherency or into alignment because people have a saying or oh, listen to your head or listen to your heart no listen to your gut and nobody knows which one and we've been in many cases not too sure which to intuitively listen to but when we align them all and become coherent with all these three brains, and now you're mentioning a fourth, and they're open to that as well, what it means when we get all four aligned and we have to make a decision, just about every time the decision we make is correct because these brains are also like antennae, they can actually sort of discern the future a little more. They're more out there into the fourth dimension or whatever, and so there's a new awakening as to what we have inside our being. And this is the new paradigm that we're entering, isn't it? Yes, for sure. And you were talking about maybe pulling into the future, fourth dimension. There's the neurological studies that show that the brain's actually making decisions before we consciously make them. You know, the retrocausality, that's fascinating. It brings up, do we really have free will? It seems like we do. But where is that integration? Where actually is the line? There seems to be some sort of other time happening than that which we experience in our waking consciousness. I see. Yes. Well, again, uh, there's, there's so much that we don't know. And I'm very keen to see if we can enter or push back the veil a little and look what's behind. Because at present, the human race is quite fragmented and dysfunctional. We 
have allowed ourselves to be influenced by mainstream media that seems to have an agenda of wanting to make us more on edge. The mainstream agenda are not pulling the threads of community together to make us or to bring us together as a global family. We seem to be just more, as I said, fragmented and dysfunctional when the importance of we're wanting the children of today and tomorrow to have a future, the 7.5 billion of humanity have to actually get their act together and realise that we're brothers and sisters and we are a global family that just happens to be wearing different bodies and experiencing different cultures, but we all share the same breath. And I think this is one of the key components. We, we share the breath, we share the microbiome, we share the energetic environment, and that's what's basically been disrupted. You know, because like if you live locally, you're integrated with the microbiome in the system, but if you have food shipped in from all over, so basically we're down to maybe 20, 30% of our internal flora and that causes they're finding out that actually causes mental aberrations the psychological effects of incorrect bacteria in your intestines thank you because this is where i I want us to take this microbiome a step further Mm -hmm. i've just come back from china and i've eaten all sorts of foods up in china and tasty as they were and nourishing as they were the first thing I got back to when I got home to New Zealand was I went out into the garden and picked at least 12 to 15 different greens and made a salad out of them instantly and ate them because I knew that all these different green leaves were, in many ways, photovoltaic cells taking in light from the sun. That was eight minutes in, in traversing time and space. And so I was eating locally this food so that I could, as you say, could get in get all the qualities that were locally into my body to help me come back into balance and just feel more aligned with being at home on my own turf, so to speak. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. That's essential. And that's really what macrobiotics, a lot of people think macrobiotics is actually like Japanese food. No, it's about eating locally because that integrates you with the microbiome. But, yeah, that eight minutes... That's old school thinking, right? Oh, the I sun's see. instant. The instantaneous transmissions of what they call space scalar, like Tesla transmissions. Which, okay. Which brings us into another line of thinking. Because some of the research I've been looking at is Russian research. Uh, this uh, Vasiliev's long-range action fields, where there's been decades of research. I started looking into it through heliobiology, Chajewski's work, where they track disease r- waves, viral waves, and sunspot numbers. It's fascinating. But then I got onto some of the research where they're showing that certain planets like Mars or Saturn, when they're in certain positions on the ecliptic and they rise on either what we call the the horizon or the meridian, they have a tendency to cause greater seismic effects, volcanoes and earthquakes. And, of course, from the Western point of view, that's crazy. The Russians have been tracking this stuff for decades. Most of the papers aren't translated, but Vasiliev, he's written a couple papers trying to explain it, what he calls the long-range action fields. Instantaneous action across long distances of space, which they've been able to track statistically all the way to Andromeda. So if we're getting instant effects from Andromeda, how many light thousands or whatever light years that's supposed to be? So the light years... Stellar transmission, that stuff's instant. We're connected real-time to the universe. The whole thing about all this also ever been measured as the speed of the wavefront of light, of the group velocity. Once the wavefront's established, we've got no idea how fast it's going behind there. Well, uh, yes, uh, I mean, we could really take us <laughs> to the next level, but you know, I know that telepathy is instant. Mm-hmm. And so th- there is one thing that jumps the so-called time barrier, And so, yes, I'd like to talk a lot about the Russian side of things because they're into plasma and the electric universe and many other things. And I was up there a couple of years ago and I realised that they're in many ways a major jump ahead of our so-called Western science. And it was Vladimir Vernadsky who talked about the new sphere, the new osphere around our planet that is the sphere of mind. And that was part of his realizing that our planet is a an extension of the biosphere you have 
once the biosphere comes together and the fact that the, the life forms, in particular the human species, come together, then and sort of a global group mind can eventuate which means there that we could as a humanity then really solve all our problems because we would all be connected at some sort of uh, telepathic type level and all it needs maybe is a change of heart for us as a humanity to realize that we're all, shall I say, brothers and sisters. For sure. Well, a couple thoughts arise on that. One is, well, apparently, according to one theory, is that we used to be connected that way and we lost it. It was Julian Jane's work, I don't know if you're familiar with that, The Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind, which was the right brains used to be connected. But it's interesting if we look at, see, I blame everything on Galileo, kind of for fun, but it makes a point. And when Galileo came in, people think, well, he just got, you know, telescope, saw the moons of Jupiter, but he was an armaments master to the Venetian armory, so the telescope was a military gear his main research was on cannonball trajectories. So the first book on modern physics was Galileo's Ballistics. And that was the beginning of modern inertialistic physics, and it was the beginning of the international armaments industry. And they've been inextricably intertwined ever since. And it was also the start of the witch hunts and the killing of all the wise women and the connections because the right brain shut down with that linear thinking. And Coming out of the Galilean impulse, they had the Florentine academies like the Academia del Cimento, where they actually issued an official contra levitatum maxim. You weren't allowed to talk about the higher forces anymore. Only that which can be weighed and measured was an official edict, which seemed to take over the minds of people. And this is what Rudolf Steiner developed anthroposophy for, was to overcome that. Because according to him, we're entering what he called the age of the intellectual soul. But in order for us to develop properly, we had to develop the discursive, which is the non-intuitive form of consciousness. But then people got trapped in it. And if we could follow that line, Galileo's cannonballs, CERN, underground, they're still just smashing Galileo's cannonballs together. Meanwhile, life's happening up on the surface with scientists don't even believe exists because they can't measure it on their equipment. You know, that's where it's all going. Yes, well, can I just jump in there? Because sure. Nikola Tesla said that when the human race studies the invisible, within one decade, we will evolve faster than we have in the last 10,000 years of our existence. But mm. it's the invisible that you're talking about too, that we have been frightened to look at the ghost in the machine, for want of a better word. And this is where we are today, the fact that we're so locked down in matter we just can't see beyond and into the invisible where in actual fact there is so much for us to measure and find. Absolutely, and people are enthralled in, let's say, quantum mechanics and stuff as though this is some new thing. And I remember a friend of mine, a brilliant researcher, came to me years ago when, when What the Bleep came out. He's going, oh, you got to go see this movie, Spirituality and Science Merged. I'm going, oh, really? He goes, yeah. I go, what is it, some quantum physics stuff? He's going, yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. Go see it. So I went and saw it at the theater. And I came back, and I, he goes, what do you think? I said, Steiner was right. I said, when mankind gets to the end of his descent into matter, he's going to end up with a vacant metaphysics. I said, they missed the whole picture. There's nothing about the higher comprehension of forces, which is what Steiner pointed towards, what we call the etheric forces, which are basically warmth, light, chemical and structural activity, and life. And these basically weave all the life around us. And... You can't weigh or measure them, but you can perceive them. And the way that that is done is intuitive development of consciousness. Steiner pointed to uh, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe's work. Yes, very the, important, it, extremely important. It's the key, the metamorphoses of plants. Now, if you look at a plant like in humans, or you can look at a human embryo, and even though we do show earlier stages of sort of animal development, whether or not that's evolution or not, there's a whole other discussion. But basically, the form is, and in humans and animals, is adumbrated in the embryo. When you go to a plant, the plant's not inside there. There's nothing in there, right? It's just a bunch of stuff. And what first happens, then you get the shoot, which is just the cotyledons sort of come up. And then out of there, you get a stem. And then out of the stem shoots the leaves. And then eventually comes up into the flower, almost dies into being with this beauty of the higher forms. 
but the plant is a single organ that metamorphoses. You can look at a human and say, that's the total human. You can think, well, they had earlier life, later life, but the total human's there. When you look at a plant, the only way you can see a plant is by cognizing it in its metamorphic stages through time because time is actually an etheric function. So it's hard to explain it's in a sound bite and get it. People need to go and actually think about this and look into this work to get it. But when you do, that actually creates a new organ of cognition because people's worldview is their organ of cognition and it's not in their neocortex. It can come in through there, but it's imprinted in their paleomammalian or the limbic cortex in the center of the brain. That's where fundamentalist ideas are formed and and this were skeptics. They're rooted fundamentalists. They're all in the middle brain. And the neocortex can bring in new information, but if the imprints in the limbic section are too strong, they don't get there. People reject it without actually analyzing it properly. Well, you see, I'm, I mean, I'm struggling right at this moment, Tom, I can assure you, because <laughs> how I see it, I, I mean, I'm, this plant has broken through the surface after being under the ground in the darkness for so long. And then it breaks through the surface and all of a sudden there's sunlight. Hey, we actually need to be more enlightened. Mm -hmm. And so from then on, the leaves shoot out and we get this flower. And this flower has got a geometry that's very profound. And you see different flowers have different geometries, but essentially there's there's a particular flower of life um, shape. And then what I really like, and I ask people, I says, well, once the flower blossoms... The fragrance. Where did this fragrance come from? How can a lot of compost and cow manure produce this brilliance of colour in the flower and then a magnificent invisible perfume? And where does the perfume go? This is the spiritual dimension I call to the flower. And we human beings, we've been locked down on the earth so long and when we actually break through and look at life from a standing that we're in sunlight, then we can then, as blossoming flowers, recognise that we are what the flower power generation opened up in 1967 in San Francisco, that we're spiritual beings having an earth experience. And this Mm -hmm. is where I'm really keen on us sharing and discussion to the fact that our planet has loaned us a body and what are we doing with it? That there is a greater picture in the whole game plan and we cannot limit ourselves to consuming consumer goods and just looking out for the next TV program or all the other material things that basically stunt our growth. <laughs> totally. And that's why, well, how do we connect to the greater picture? That's always been my thing because I've always searched for that. So I know, funny as it may sound, one of the most profound spiritual books I ever read was called Cosmological Botany planetary influences upon plants which is about so you look at plants you're talking about these different geometries well yes. where do they come from yes you know goethe with his higher form of cognition intuited what he calls the archetypal plant which all plants there is only one plant the vegetative surface of the planet which goes through all these different metamorphoses but where is like he the Schiller used to argue with him. He goes, yeah, because that's just an idea. And Goethe says, yeah, well, I'm, I can see ideas, you know, with the higher form of mind. So where does that geometry come from? Well, it comes from the planets, both the heliocentric and the geocentric nature of structures in space form plant morphology. And this is quite distinct. There's a lot of work in German, very little in English on it. Uh, it, I always like it when I'm looking at something, you go search on the internet and there's nothing. You know you're on to (laughs) something. I I see. Because I've seen some geometries of of how Venus interacts with the Earth and the Sun and how the petals of a plant open up and Venus has a very important part to play. Oh, totally. All of the plants do. It's, it's too complex to go into. We'd have to do yeah. a whole show on it and yes. work people through. But basically, the stem is the sun, the roots are the moon, the leaves are Mercury, and when they get pushed further out, then they're influenced by Venus. And, of course, we can see this. Let's just take uh, something like what we call the bind weeds, like the morning glories and stuff that Argerias and those types They go winding along because the mercury influence is strong. And if you look at the flower, it actually, between the center of the flower and the outside, is a little mercury sort of pattern in there of its orbit around the sun. 
And because in that plant, mercury overcomes the sun, and that's why it winds, so the mercury controls it. So you mean to say that it goes around like a, a vine will always, what they call, creep or continue to go, right. around, to go around anything like beans will go up a large stake, mm-hmm. and it's that mercury making so the mercury influence overcomes the sun and pulls those around yes and then then the venus influence you know shapes the leaves and stuff then the mars influence and jupiter influence sort of pull out more if you see bigger sort of things and jupiter is kind of in the fruitings saturn is really the outer planet pulls up like the trees and stuff so there's a whole interweaving again this is these are sort of ideas you can't all you can do is tell people about them in a discussion like this. They've got to go look at it. Thank you. It takes yes. time to actually figure these things out. Yes. But there's rich, deep, intuitive knowledge laying within those. And you're talking about the Venus pattern. Like if you take an apple and you cut it in half across the axis, not from the top down, you see the five pattern in a papaya. That's the signature of Venus. And this is totally interwoven in our lives. And it goes deeper. We can look at, like, Jagadis Chandra Bose, the great Indian scientist who... Thank you. He was the one in the autobiography of a yogi. Right. Well, I came across him. I did see it in there, right? But I came across him in Secret Life of Plants. Oh, yes. Yeah. Now, Bose, uh, they call it the, the, the scientist who befriended plants and metals. Thank you. Now, of course, he was working with plants, and he built all this. Of course, he was doing radio transmission stuff before Marconi and Tesla. A lot of people don't know that, but... He was also, uh, he invented sort of microwave transmissions, but he was working with plants and their sensitive motion. So he was making these like platinum springs and these super fine instruments. And then he was drugging the plants with like chloroform and ether and watching the reactions. And he was getting anomalous reactions in the stuff. So he, he actually started drugging the metals. And what he showed is, is that, so if, if let's say you have like a animal tissue, plant tissue and a strip of metal and you run a signal through it with it and you have it going up on an oscilloscope. You can see the pattern of the signal. And then you drug it, like say with chloroform or ether, and you get a distinct pattern change, obviously. It happens in the animal, it happens in the plant, it happens in the metal. In the metal too. What or type of metal? Just Any it. metal. Any metal. So what this actually shows is is that the biological reactions, what we think of as biological reactions, arise in the mineral state. There's a couple of pieces of this puzzle. Then there was Giorgio Picardi. Um, he was a, pro- a professor that was the head of the chemistry department at the University of Florence in the 1950s and 1960s. And in industrial and pharmaceutical chemistry, they always have, they were getting these problems. You get anomalous reactions. Sometimes stuff doesn't work. It can be very costly in that business. So they're researching, you know, what causes this. So they were doing a standardized test of bismuth chloride mixed with water to basically create a colloidal salt or a colloidal solution and then they were timing that and keeping records over like a couple decades and tracking it against solar cycles and geomagnetic disturbances of course they were doing the experiment inside and outside faraday cages you know with treated yes. water and untreated water for basic experiments and they were doing it all over the world wow. russia were- italy down kirgoyland island up in the indian ocean yes. just just to get all the data properly. And what they found is is that the minerals in the colloidal state, up, and of course then they were doing like blood coagulation tests with like chicken blood and stuff and testing the timings of those as well with it. And they were finding it was reacting exactly to the cosmic influences, the magnetic fields and the sunspots. And then we look at the Russian research and the heliobiology, all these disease waves, polio, diphtheria, scarlet fever, all these things, all the viral diseases followed solar cycles until the insertion of vaccines in, which screwed up. And you can actually see a lot of the diseases went back up after the insertions of the vaccines. It's like polio was already dying out in the population because that's one of the things people say, well, vaccines, well, what about polio? And I go, well, my older sister and my brother-in-law both got polio from the vaccine, so you're not going to pull that one on me, I'll tell you that. No kidding. And I've got all the charts and data on that going back like over 100 years. So it's a fascinating thing. And then that's fascinating itself. So we've got Bose. He's showing the reactions are at the mineral level. Picardi, he's showing that this stuff's acting at the at the mineral level as well. And then we look at Lily Calisco, brilliant medical doctor. She was an associate of Rudolf Steiner's. 
and Steiner tasked her with figuring out if there was actually a connection between the noble metals and the planets from alchemy, gold in the sun, silver in the moon. And, and for, to just give a simple example, because they're quite complex experiments over decades, when the moon goes in front of the sun, gold doesn't crystallize properly, right? And she's done a couple of books. I did a video on this on my YouTube channel on her work on lead and Saturn, which is it's just amazing, you know, the, the effects on the metals is... I don't know, it's beyond words. You know, you really have to, like, think this very, one out. Very pronounced. But one interesting thing I wanted to throw in, because we only got a short time, yes. and this is and this ties in a little yes. bit earlier. Yes. Now, in 1964, Lily Kalisco gave a paper to a group of anthroposophical physicians, Gold in the Signs of the Times. Because she started her first solar e- eclipse experiments were in 27, then she did some in the 36, I think, and then 47. Fantastic experiments. But she found in... 1964, she was saying, you know, something happened. She says, it's starting in the 1950s, the gold wasn't crystallizing properly at all. These dark streaks that would happen when the moon was in front of the sun. She was getting them all the time, and she was wondering what it was and whether or not they could still use gold as a homeopathic medicine for the heart. Considering this, but what happened in the 1950s was the advent, great electrification of the planet, radar, all that yes. stuff, right, with light. With electricity as the fallen light ether, we've basically cutting ourselves off from the cosmos with this horrible electromagnetic environment that we've created, which is the exact opposite of what Tesla's technology we would have had. It wasn't electromagnetic, his stuff. It was magnetodielectric, faster than light. So, yeah, how do we turn it around? I don't know the answer, but I know what's wrong. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. well, well, it's really interesting. And um, to tie this all in, the fact that there's so many planetary influences here on Earth and suns are very much involved. It's like, I see our galaxy, from a galactic point of view, our galaxy is a gigantic, gibundus jellyfish, and every sun is like a nucleus of a cell, and our solar system is a cell within the this galactic jellyfish, and if we can see it from that standpoint, we can understand the connections from all of the planets as a you know, swirl around our sun and also from you know the astrological point of view there's the geometry of all these planets that if you can see them you can sort of draw a straight line or sort of straight line because light bends in space but there is this greater connection that here we are we've got living on this organism here on earth and we're endeavoring to find our way in life and as you say there's some very pronounced human beings who have come into the world and essentially, we haven't learnt of their existence. And you, as a researcher, particularly with Borderlands, and here you are today, you're giving people names of very, very potent and important people who have witnessed and done research that mainstream science, our universities, which are supposed to be the study of the universe, hence university, the universities have lost their way completely. And so we have to virtually have to depend on our intuition, talking with our neighbor. (laughs) It's, It's a grassroots revolution to essentially find a way to get our communities to come closer together and as a people grow into the light of our own true selves. So what do we need to do to become more knowing, more feeling and just realize that our planet is in a, a critical state at the moment. You, you've said that we've, we've cloaked it in an energy that is not natural anymore. What do you think we need to do, Tom? Well, what I do is I look out and I, I see the big picture that you're saying. How do we change this? Well, I find for myself, I mean, I try to change myself. You're that's, right. That's the start. But then what I do discover, I share. Yes. You know, I mean, I've been doing that for the last three, four decades, um, coming across this information just because it interests me. I mean, this isn't a job. I don't get paid for this. I wish I did. (laughs) We're in the same team here. (laughs) Exactly, Tim. I know, because I remember you showed me that newspaper. You were doing this stuff back in the 70s. You've you've been looking at this a long time. Yes. So um, you understand where this is coming from. So, yeah, but how do you share it with other people? How do you change the world at large? And this is something, while seeing it happening, 
whether or not we can do it individually other than just changing ourselves. But, you know, all the research going on now, the, the electric universe people, all this microbiome research which is going on, you know, the fungi research, Paul Stamets and other people like yes. that. Just, people just have to open their minds and look out. People get wrapped up. I know a lot of people probably get upset because I say this, but they're so wrapped up in, like, voting and, you know, it's always a, everybody, everybody was so abusive to everybody, you know, over this, like, last election. I'm thinking, well, beyond the bankers won anyway. It doesn't matter who's in there <laughs> because it's an international slave system, which people – and the system is us. The system is us neglecting our inner responsibility and connections to the universe. So the way around that is for us to wake up each individually – and some may not have the sort of ability that I do to, like, go through all these different scientific things and look at them. But just go out and stare at plants for a while and think about it. Go, wow, they're connected to the planets and how they move. I'm speaking to Thomas Brown. He's an American living in New Zealand and has had a huge insightful life studying the areas of existence and also working with borderlands. That was many decades ago. And you can find their website at borderlandresearch.com, borderlandresearch.com, and you will be able to look at the different edges of existence and realize that when we push these particular areas, we come into information that we've never known before. So I'm very happy to be able to speak to Tom Brown today. And this is, you know, gets into the world systems. So people think, well, you know, Copernicus, you know, he figured out that Earth was going around the sun instead of the other way around. Well, what I've discovered is they're both happening. The Earth does go around the sun. You can measure it. You can calculate it. There's a lot of evidence of that, despite what some of the geocentrists say, and I love their arguments. But Earth is the center as far as life goes. This is the anthropic principle. The center is everywhere. The circumference nowhere. You know, that was... Uh, Hermes in the book of 24 philosophers. Yes. So there's higher order functions of space. Everything's not just empty space in 3D. In fact, space isn't even 3D. Space is one dimension. The three dimensions are us. When Copernicus, that whole Copernican revolution was the removal of our intuitive sense and putting it into matter. As so Steiner said, that was the gravest error of mankind's descent into matter was removing of the proprioceptive spiritual three dimensions from ourselves and putting it in as a metric of matter in the objective world so yeah just reconnect inside i'm trying to squeeze it in before the interview is over it's 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 so important because sri aurobindo was an interesting man and he said we're here our job now is to spiritualize matter Mm -hmm. Uh, it is for us to bring through more light and more knowingness around that matter is just a, an energy field anyway but a lot of us have forgotten about this and and so you know I, I look at i look at the whole picture and i think gosh how do we change this and i'm i've been a star trek watcher for many years and i've ran into spock by chance in moscow way back in 1986 and we had a very interesting communication around uh, teleportation. Anyway, as it is, is that uh, on the, the Enterprise they have a holodeck and it's a hologram and they go in and they can program the hologram to fulfill certain dramas or whatever. And in many ways I see myself as a hologram on this planet and um, everything else and you're a hologram too, but an intelligent one, <laughs> a good heart. And what it is is that we have to realize that our bodies, they may be cellular, but they're very temporary at the same time. And soon we're going to have to find ourselves vacating the premises, as I say. Mm-hmm. We, our body will go dust to dust, atom to atoms, and, and the essence of who we are, well, that's a, another story again. We won't, in most cases, I'm finding that there are so many people in our world who d- don't acknowledge soul. Hugely, and they don't actually factor their soul with consciousness. And they, uh, in many cases, as I spent some time with an American, are we born to reproduce to die? And I say, no, we're not. But if that is the common thought pattern, 
that you find, say, in the political arena, if you go out into the world, all they're interested in is basically consuming as much and grabbing as much whilst they're alive, and then slowly they fade out to die. And what are we doing? We're, we've missed the whole game plan of what existence is all about. And so as we carry on in, in this world with the challenges of the military-industrial machine, all that money so-called one and a half trillion dollars a year would solve every problem on this planet in five years we can have everything sorted and yet we can't seem to shoehorn the people of power out of power and basically out of the whole game we need to be able to find a way to i don't know i wake up every morning and i think how can we find a very very creative innovative way of getting people to realize that we are far more than we think we are. Well, that's what I work on. That's why I've been working on presentations um, with videos. And I really feel like I'm sort of coming into where I should have been long ago, where I thought I may have been 30 or 40 years ago. I used to think I really knew what was going on. And now I've realized how little I know. Yes. I mean, sure, I can talk about all these different people, but actually, they're just sort of doorways I want to go through and learn so much more. So how do we really figure this out that's a good question i think you know for each person it's just a matter of them connecting understanding yep making the connection i mean the heart is a very important one that a lot of people are still disconnected you know, they talk about the great journey from the head to the heart right. and of course you're you're taking it further down to the gut as well right. and we we really have to start to feel and a lot of people don't know how to feel particularly the men oh i agree and that's because of the left brain thing and that's why you know it's you say what really do i have a lot of thoughts that i can't put into words yet <laughs> um because it's a feeling yes. it's an intuition of what can be done so i try to fill it in you know, all these little bits i've talked about they're, they're objectified so what i'm looking at is like a pragmatic metaphysics a way of actually you know because people like they believe all sorts of stuff you know spiritual stuff it runs the gamut and i've done sort of comparative religion studies and uh, you know so my main interest is sort of comparing the vajrayana mandala to steiner's ethers which i find ties in quite well as far as a larger picture so from my point of view i'm looking at it at that as a core archetype and trying to spread the different ideas that bring people towards seeing that how we have these functional archetypes within nature that we all respond to. You're talking about the holographic universe. I agree with that in a sense, but so we're projections in a sense, and everything we deal with is projections, but what are we projecting on? That's what interests me, the dynamic field, and that's why I like the Vajrayana and Steiner's Etheric Sciences both, because they show both the projection medium and the projection field as a structural archetype. So... Which all religions have little tiny pieces here and there. They take off and then they try to like just do a little bit, do a dogmatic overlay of it. But that's why I say just go connect with nature. You know, there's nothing greater than, you know, looking at the sky and the sun. People talk about the wave particle duality. Well, there it is right in the sky. You got the yellow dot and the blue sheet. That is the wave particle duality happening right in front of you every day. And that could bring us off into yeah. Tesla tech yeah. and other and Steiner's stuff, but that's another hour. That's right. I, I mean, I've been lucky that I've, I was born on a farm and we had a river running through it. And in those days, it was a crystal clear river. And so I could just go there down the back of a farm, nobody would see me, take off my clothes and just stand in my, up to my waist or, or even just up to my ankles, it all depends, and, and allow this water. And I see this snake of silver c- coming down through the paddocks and then all around me, and I'd turn around and I'd see this uh, snake of silver water, transparent atoms, just disappearing into the distance. And then I could pick up, put my hands in the water, and clasp my hands together, take this water, and drink this water, realizing it's sparkling, shimmering, transparent atoms just passing in through my whole body. And it was a, a major, major connection to realize that we have so much possibility to connect at this deeper level of being. Oh, absolutely. And water is a resonant medium for absorbing like the energies of the cosmos. 
It is because you know when the stream is flowing downwards, there's actually a a weak electrostatic charge flowing the other way, what we call orgone. Yes. Um, and orgone is not exactly electrostatics because we see lightning hitting and people go, oh, that's just like electrons flowing. You know, we look, I look at it as collapse of dielectric lines of force. But let's say you're in, taking a physics class and you have like a Wimshurst generator, a little static generator, and it's raining outside, right? And the thing's not working that well. And this, the teacher says, well, you know, we'll run better on a dry day. And go, well, if those sparks are electrostatics, then how come it's sparking out in the rain, right? Because there's different aspects of it. So I used to live on the Matol River in California. And uh, every fall, which was in September, we'd go out and clean the river. There's all these beautiful little natural flow forms, which I filmed a video on um, Schauberger's work in 1991, Nature Was My Teacher. And we filmed some of that okay. on, on the flow forms behind my house. Yes. But whenever we'd clean those and clean up all of because the river would go down because no rains, Always, as soon as you cleaned it up, we'd spend like an hour or two, and you could feel the breeze starting to come up from the ocean, and it would always rain within 24 to 48 hours every year. But it got to be a thing. People come over, and we'd do a big river clean and wait for the rain. <laughs> so, so when you did the river clean, quickly, you, you picked up branches or and bottles? And no, it was branches and leaves. Branches and leaves. Because it was a, it was a, they called it a river. It was more of a big creek. And over the summer, as the level went down, leaves would drop down and it would just sort of get filled in and yes water would still be trickling but it wasn't a real flow okay so what you're saying just quickly because um uh, Schelberger maintained that water was a being mm -hmm. that actually has infiltrated our planet which is an interesting phenomenon but so if you have the water running and there's these little eddies and it runs twists and and spins one way and then goes down to some stones and then spins the other way. Mm -hmm. And all these little v mini vortexes, once they are free of all the leaves, or well, once the water's free of all the leaves, these vortexes can happen. These are the, the interrelationship that causes the, the air to come up from the sea. Absolutely. It's, and so when trout want to jump up rapids and even jump up waterfalls, these little vortices also go up the waterfalls to allow the trout to catch the energy and then go further up the river? Right. That's the levity force that the Florentine Academicians ruled that you're not allowed to think about. Uh -huh. And nobody has for the last 500 years except brilliant minds like Goethe, Schauberger, Tesla. They all knew about these yes. things. Yes. Yeah, and then uh, Lord Kelvin, he, the Kelvin generator, okay. right? Where he actually demonstrated two streams of water going through copper pipes or tubes, dropping down and hitting other ones, and you connect the bottom of one to the top of the other, back and forth, actually creates electrostatic sparks. So just the flow of the water itself is... The, so when the river's going down, there's an opposite flow going up. It's been measured. If you have what they call organo testers and life force meters, you can actually measure that flow. And it's that's what Trevor Constable was using with his geometric rain engineering devices. <laughs> and this, of course, is an extension of Wilhelm Reich. Yep. And this is a whole, the orgo and everything is so powerful. Look, I, we're running short of time. <laughs> I want to just throw this in because thunder. When you see lightning, I mean, this jagged, brilliant electric light. And then you get this incredible thunder. I mean, it's still hard to understand that atoms, or should we say molecules or cloud, can actually make such a damn racket, make such a huge noise, and it still defies logic. I still can't work it out that you can have a streak of lightning and then, which most probably just splits all the atoms, that causes then this gigantic, profound Thunder! It's it's right. it's too much for me. Well, well, it's not atomic. The atoms might be formed once the lines collapse, but these are the dielectric. Because we think of Earth's magnetic field, but Earth has an electric field too, and you know, related to electrostatics. When those lines collapse, that's why you see all the jagged stuff happening. And we demonstrated this in the lab at Borderland Labs back in the nineteen eighties with big capacitors, and we just had like threads coming off, and you charge the capacitor up, and you can see the lines. You know, the threads will fill the lines of force. Th that's a collapse. And uh, Eric Dollard's uh, Tesla magnifying transmitter that we were experimenting with out the Integratron in the 80s, 
this was putting out these beautiful discharges, organic looking, because it was non electromagnetic. It was the magneto dielectric Tesla currents. But when you see the discharge coming off the top of the coil, we were actually measuring r- five radio frequency amperes into ground. So it was actually an implosive. So when you see the lightning, it's not just like electrons flowing from ground, sky to ground, or in reverse. It's a collapse of these lines of force, which creates this effect, which blows the sound out. Because it's, I'll tell you what, it's, 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 you can understand why early peoples in the world thought that the gods above the clouds were displeased with them or something. Whatever, yeah. Because it is, it is just another profundity of nature. I mean, it's like if you're down in the South Pole and you ask somebody to point to God, they'll point to the sky. And yet if you're at the North Pole of our planet and say point to God, and they'll point to the sky uh, above their head as well, and they're both different directions to where they're pointing, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. It's just that we've got a very limited perspective here on our planet. And as... uh, the necessary or the need for people to really recognize that that there is we're surrounded by magic and that the human species uh, i am magic you are magic and as i've said for the last 10 years every baby born into this realm is an energy bundle of exponential potential Mm -hmm. but we lock children down by saying shut up go to bed keep quiet go to your room when in actual fact, all they're wanting to do is blossom and grow. Oh, yes, for sure. And one of the important things is, you know, there's that old hermetic axiom, as above, so below. It's interpreted many ways, but as I've found over the years, what it means is the out- subjective and objective. That's the true meaning. I mean, we see little effects of it in some senses, but we're talking about it as the plant morphology, the relationship to the planets, the effects of planets and stars on seismic activity and the, and the properties of metals, that's all happening inside of us. You know, this is like quantum stuff. They say, well, you know, we just look at something, it's a collapsing of the wave field. It's only because of the observer. I call it the double-slit quantum god error. Uh, you know, it's a self-deception. We are part of the universe. We're here. That's what's, We're anthropic consciousness nodes. The universe, in order to exist, we'll say, well, I was little, I go, well, theoretically, nothing should exist. Why are we here? That's a big puzzle. Well, because in order for, if there was some greater thing, God is a metaphor for that, which we don't understand, how in the world can you know yourself if you don't have polarity? So you need some sort of polarization in order to have experience. To stir stir things up. Actually, so we're living through that. So we go through these different phases, and we're going through a phase right now. We can call it the Kali Yuga or whatever. Clearly, we're disconnected. You know, we're lost in matter. We're making an amazing technology, but it's enslaving us in a sense. Yeah, what the answer is, I don't know, but I... As uh, Kwai Chang Kane said in the old Kung Fu, okay, yeah. he said, I seek not the answer, but to better understand the question. Uh-huh. Yeah, well, it's, <laughs> there's lots of <laughs> things. Now, we've talked a little bit about soul, or just mentioned a soul. Okay, there's the God equation. I mean, a lot of people, my father was a, a Catholic, and he threw religion out the door. He threw the baby out of the bathwater, and yet... Most indigenous peoples have a, an understanding that there's a greater reality and that uh, we call this greater reality God. And there's an old saying there that if all human beings became God conscious, then we would uh, instantly have this planet awaken all at once. Oh, there is a possibility because basically if there is a God, then we are representatives. We're, we're extensions. Everything is. You can see this interconnection. I mean, that's what these, all these different experiments and researchers, all of, all of them show this complete interconnection in, with life. Life is magic. You know, you go to the, as Trevor Constable used to say, you go to the greatest medical universities in the West and they can't tell you what life is. They, they actually can't define in technical terms, the difference between a living being and a corpse. He said, but you go to Hong Kong, he said, even the street sweepers are practicing qigong and stuff. He said, it's just part of their culture. You know, we need to 
get our mind into these larger ideas. So true. I mean, the fact is that you've mentioned the word Trevor James Constable. Mm -hmm. He was a New Zealander. He was. And yet he lived overseas, and you'll find zero mention of him in any books or anything in New Zealand, solely because he was one step out of a game. He was far beyond the normal, basic Kiwi thinking and as we know, we've got to dump the Kiwi as a emblem for New Zealand because who wants to have a an insignia that's essentially a lost in the scrub, cannot see in the dark and cannot fly to have a, an overview of things. So I'm just having a little dig at the fact that <laughs> New Zealanders, we have to pull the, the blinkers from our eyes and really start opening up to our place in the universe. Yeah, you know, there's some brilliant thinkers here. Um, I've got yes. many wonderful friends. And when I ran Borderland Research back in the 80s and 90s, we did mail order publishing of all these alternative ideas. And some of my best customers were New Zealanders. <laughs> and I can say for all the foreign subscribers we had, from all over the world, the greatest number were from New Zealand. There's great hope for New Zealand. Yep. I still believe in that. Yeah, New Zealand still holds the key in many ways. Thank Even you. people go back to 1835, hey, Waka Putanga, you know, the proclamation of sovereign states of the hereditary chiefs of the northern tribes. That's actually the key. That's the true world order, the key for unraveling this whole system when people really understand it. But that's another whole discussion. Yes, it certainly is. And the great pity of it all is that we're running out of time. We haven't been able to transcend time yet, Thomas. Yet. But, but we know it's possible. Mm -hmm. And we need to be able to find ways to get through this. Tom, have you got a website? Is there a connection so that if anybody wanted to follow up on it, you've got a YouTubes, whatever? Yeah, yeah, well, I do have uh, thomasbrown.org. I don't keep it up on it that much, but there's a few articles there and some links to my YouTube channel and stuff. Currently, I'm acting as senior science advisor to uh, New Earth Nation, New Earth University, uh, which is based off Humanitad, which is an NGO out of London. So I've been working with them. We're looking at bioarchitecture, ways of bringing sort of structures in that actually enhance life. Yes. Um, looking at a lot of different ideas. So, yeah, that... You know, that's one way to find me. I'm on Facebook like everybody is. As much as I dislike it, it's also a great place to connect. So, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Tom. Well, look, thank you. Um, let, let's just trust that we can be the change that we're looking for. And, I, I mean, you and I, we, I feel that I'm doing it, and I know that you're doing it. So all we need is 7.5 over a billion human beings doing it too, and we've got a very promising future. Oh, no, it sounds great, Tim. I really appreciate talking with you. you know, you're, you're lucid, aware, and you understand. You see the bigger picture. I mean, we've always had good conversations, yes. so you know, thank you for the opportunity to chat. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I really appreciate it. Cool. That was fun. That was Thomas Brown expanding on his cosmology of how he sees existence and a very profound storyteller. But I also would like to actually apologise deeply to Tom and you too, my listening audience. I just couldn't stop talking. I was just rabbiting on and I want to express my upsetness at listening to me when in actual fact I invited Thomas to come here and have him tell his story. However, as a result, I'm going to invite him back as soon as I can because he has too much to offer and we need to be able to expand our horizons and get a deeper understanding of existence. And he is one person who can elucidate and help us on our journey. Thank you. I invite you to be able to come to greenplanetfm.com where we have over 400 interviews in our database which you can readily download and listen to to be able to inspire yourself to become the change you want to see in the world and become involved in caring for your children and grandchildren's future. We are also on Facebook on greenplanetfm.com and ourplanet.org. Please come and love us. This is Tim Lynch. And or Lisa Eyre. And Liz Gunn. In the spirit of Aroha, wishing you a wonderful week. We look forward to being with you next week. I say... Kia kaha and hairi rā.